John 8, 31 through 36 says this, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Happy 4th of July. We're almost there. Uh, It's not third winter anymore or second spring. Uh, I love this time of year, 4th of July. It's one of my favorite times of year. There's barbecues and there's parties. We always like to get out on the river and float the rivers. And and there's going to be probably a thousand of you out on the Madison River this week, just enjoying the sunshine and floating down the river and celebrating. Uh, Some of you are going to uh, play around with fireworks. Not those of you who live in Bozeman uh, city limits, right? (laughs) I know how you roll. I know how you roll. I used to live in Colorado when we drive to Cheyenne. You know why? Fireworks. Anyway, um, so between, between the fireworks and, and your uh, property taxes this week, rough week for everybody, right? <laughs> Can I get an amen? Woo! Okay. <laughs> if you work for the city of Bozeman, we're so glad you're here. Um, <laughs> oh, shoot. That's how we're starting this morning. Fourth of July. What a fun fun time for us all. And it's an incredible time for us to remember and, and celebrate those who have put their lives on the line for our freedoms and for our country. Um, I have a grandfather uh, who served in World War II. He was a front line, um, uh, he, he was a front line gunman and he actually received a Purple Heart um, a lot of you have a similar story uh, about grandfathers. Um, John Chris does this joke about how if we had a draft now, that would be a bad thing. Have you heard this one? Like if we had a draft now, that'd probably be pretty bad for our country because it'd be like, uh, I don't think I can go to war. I have gluten problems. <laughs> like <laughs> a little soft, a little soft. Not sure you can shoot a gun anymore. Okay. Um, <laughs> but so grateful for uh, for my grandfather, my, my brother-in-law serves in the Air Force. And, and what's been really interesting uh, since I started this new business uh, about a year ago um, is I, I've done a lot of work with, with military folks. And I have grown in my, uh, in my love for them, in my respect for them. Um, they are uh, men and women of courage and of service. And I'm so grateful. I have friends um, that we, we had one guy up on stage here, the big buff guy over here playing the guitar, ripping. Like he's a West Point grad, right? Um, we have, yeah, um, we, have, we have lots and lots of folks here uh, in, in this group who are part of the military, who have served, and we're so, we're so grateful. One of them uh, was one of my clients, uh, and he was a former Marine. And so I want to share with you a little bit about um, what his legacy statement is. See, in what I do is we create a legacy statement for every single guy. So 20 words or less where we help uh, define what their life is, what their why is. And you'll love this. So he's a Marine. And so his, his statement is this. I was put on this earth to aggressively protect freedom. How Marine is that, Right? <laughs> To, to aggressively protect freedom through deliberate innovation, through training men to become an asset because lots of you are liabilities. And that's, I just added that. <laughs> Sometimes I have too. <laughs> and by ruthlessly pursuing every, every opportunity that God gives to me, that's what he wakes up for every day on mission for the Lord. Here's the 4th of July question, right? How do you define Freedom. How do you define freedom? See, what we're celebrating this week is July 4th, 1776. All right, we'll go back to school. What did we do on July 4th, 1776? Somebody yell it out. 
Oh man, we need some American history up in here. Okay, like, I don't know. G- Jesus, Jesus is the answer. Jesus, we're in church. No, <laughs> come on, you guys. Somebody online should have written that in, right? Declaration of Independence was signed July 4th, 1776. It says this, we hold these truths to be self Evident. I'm not sure it's as self-evident as it was back then. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Free to pursue life, to pursue liberty, and to pursue Happiness. This is how the Declaration of Independence defines freedom without constraint. In our country's history later, the Constitution was written that gives us the freedom to elect those who represent us, the people. It gives us the freedom of religion. It gives us the freedom of speech. It gives us the freedom to bear arms. Okay, um, uh, so so uh, I, have some, I have kiddos and they're at a, a small Christian school. And uh, a couple years ago, there was a Thanksgiving little special and there was a bunch of kids and they were saying what they were thankful for. And so we got down to like a kindergartner and he, he just said really out loud, like they were like, what are you thankful for? And what are you thankful for? And what are you thankful for? And he just goes, the right to bear arms. <laughs> he goes to church here. I'm just letting you know. Okay. How do you define freedom? See, freedom, it really is about being without constraint, right? The opposite of that is to be enslaved, right? To be enslaved. So so freedom is to be without constraint. And, And these are some beautiful definitions, but there's some edge to freedom too, isn't there? There's some edge to freedom. If we don't define it properly, we will have some problems with freedom. I actually believe that's why we're in the place that we're in today because some have defined freedom to pursue happiness for whatever makes them happy and doesn't hurt anybody else theoretically, right? And and that is why we find ourselves in the place that we do find ourselves today because total um, constraint-free freedom could lead to anarchy. It could lead to everyone doing whatever feels right to them. So how do we, how do we define it better than that? How do we define it, not just for our country, but in our families and in our lives and in everyone that we influence and, and, and have a part of their life? How do we define this freedom in a better way, in a more godly way? And I think what we need is we need to look at the definition Jesus gives to us, Right? Like these definitions found in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, these, these men who wrote this, right, they, they had a, a sense of this that, that has been lost to us. And, and I want to rekindle that flame, at least here in the church this morning, okay? Because I want us to get back to the, the roots of this, that, that we define freedom by the way Jesus defines freedom. Because Jesus defines and describes for us an even greater freedom. I don't just want us to settle for an American freedom, although that is a beautiful and amazing freedom that we celebrate this week. What I want us to do is go deeper than that church. I want us to go further than that because Jesus describes for us an even greater freedom. As Christians, our definition must be different than the world. Our definition must match that of Jesus's. And and he describes this in his passage. And and there's two main pushes that he shares with us as as he's sharing with us uh, about where we define, how we define, how we describe freedom. First, he he says to us this, we need to understand that if we want to understand a better freedom, we need to understand that Jesus is the teacher, We need to understand Jesus as the teacher. This is what Jesus' role, one of his roles was when he walked the earth. He was his teacher to his disciples. They called him rabbi, which literally means teacher. And so he was the disciples' teacher and he is our teacher as well. He says this, if you hold to my teaching, then you are really my disciple. 
if you hold my teaching, then you are really my disciple. How do we understand a greater freedom? We have to begin by understanding that Jesus is the teacher. Jesus is the teacher. I think in a sermon like this, I was, uh, you know, I've been working on this all week and, and it's easy for us. It's easy for us to go, yeah, Brian, you tell them. Guess what? They're not here. Right? They, whoever they are, whoever you got in their mind, they're not here. Share the podcast. That'd be awesome, right? Let them know that they can watch this. But listen, you're here. So let's talk, let's talk to us this morning, right? Let's talk to us this morning. If you hold to his teachings, then you're really his disciples. Not if you come to church, then you're really his disciples. Not if you think good thoughts and don't say bad words, then you're really his disciples. But if you hold to his teachings, then, then you are really his disciples. Let me ask you this question. Are you teachable? Are you teachable? I'll, I'll, I'll start here and then I'll go there, right? Like, I struggle with that sometimes. Like, you already figured out, if you've never heard me preach, you already figured out, like, this dude has an opinion, right? Okay? And for those of you who've listened to me preach for the last four years, you're like, yep, he does, <laughs> right? And, and, and there's a beautiful, I'm not asking you to give up your opinions, but what I am asking me to do and you to do is to ask this question, am I teachable? Am I teachable? I, I coached basketball uh, in various places over the years, and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what the worst kind of player to work with as a coach is. One that is uncoachable. A kid that's uncoachable, I, like I barely have time for that kid. A kid who just says, I know it all. I don't need your help. I already figured it out. My mom and dad told me I was amazing. And so you don't need to tell me that I need to work on anything. I don't want to work with that kid. And no coach in the world wants to work with an uncoachable player. Are we teachable? Are we coachable? Are we looking for the teacher to teach us? There, there, there is a sentiment of humility in here that I'm gonna to point to us in the room because they aren't here right now. Remember that? They aren't here. Are we humble? Are we a humble church? Are we a teachable church? Are, are, we, are we listening for the voice of the teacher? Are we studying? This is what a learner does. Are we studying? Like, I'm gonna show you something that happened. And I'm, this is like one of those humble brags. You're like, ah, I'm humble. You know, anyway, you get it, okay. This is what happened with my Bible this week, okay? This should happen to your Bible as well, all right? Your Bible that's on the shelf that looks really pretty, I'm not impressed by, okay? I want your Bible to fall apart at a men's retreat this past week. That's what I want to happen to your Bible. I want you to be so deep into this. You've been around these people, right? They're like, they just, passages just come off their tongue, left and right. There's this counselor, Henry Cloud, and, and I just, I love him. He wrote a book called Boundaries, written like 40 some books. Unbelievable speaker, counselor, pastoral figure. And he was doing an interview and I was just marveling at the fact that he was just drawing upon story and story and metaphor and parable and Old Testament passage and New Testament passage. It was just, just flowing out of him as he was having this conversation about building trust. And, and, he, and like everything he was talking about, was just like the Bible was just coming out of him. It was alive and active and, and just it, it was in him. It wasn't just written on his head, it was written on his heart and it was so obvious you've been around these people. And a good student, what do they do? They study, don't they? They study. I want the cover to fall off of your Bible. And I'm gonna be honest, I'm going old school. Like I'm talking about freedom today and Bibles today and I'm pounding on the, it's not a pulpit, but you get it, okay? Right? Like I want you to buy a Bible Buy a really nice Bible. I'll pick on me. I spent a lot of money on fly fishing 
fly rods. And then I'm like, $100 for a Bible? Really? I'm like, I don't think about that with fly rods. I promise you that, okay? I promise you that. Go buy yourself a really nice study Bible, right? If you want to celebrate freedom this week, go buy yourself a really nice study Bible and invest in that Bible and read the words and let the words read you and let it change you and let it, let it work on you. Be a learner, be teachable. And then what else does a learner do? They're, they're teachable, they study, and then they learn, right? Like do a test. Are you learning? Like what are the, what's the fruit test? This is one of Jesus's parables, right? Like you'll know a good tree by its good fruit as you'll know a bad tree by its bad fruit. So if you like, I go to church, but I treat my neighbor like crap, guess what? Bad fruit, right? Well, I, I, don't, I don't cuss, but I... I, I really, really cheat and lie the tax system. Well, huh, interesting. That's an interesting line to draw, isn't it? What is the fruit? Is there love? Is there joy? Is there peace? Is there patience? Is there kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Is there fruit because of what you have learned, if you hold my teachings, Jesus says, then you are really my disciples. And even greater freedom comes from knowing Jesus as the teacher. Secondly, an even greater freedom is, comes to us from knowing Jesus as the truth. Jesus as the truth. It's not just good enough for him to be a great teacher. He is more than that. He is the truth, capital T, incarnate. When we hear Jesus, we hear the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help him, because his name is Jesus, okay? He says this, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, right? 1901, was the first mass publication of the Red Letter Bible. Uh, it was a little combined effort. Uh, D.L. Moody, who had a, has a Bible Institute, uh, I think it's still there in Chicago, um, and some others who put together a Bible. And inside the Bible, the words of Jesus are written in red. How many of you got a Bible with red letters, right? Okay, good, right? Those are the words of Jesus. And when you read those words, you read the truth. And when you read this word, you read the truth. You don't just read good teachings, good thoughts, good morals. What you read in here, what you learn in here, what you digest in here, what shapes your life in here is the capital T, truth. And can we just say, we need more truth, don't we? Like, I need it. Once again, they're out there. They're not listening to the sermon. But can I be honest? I need more truth. You wanna know why? I lie to myself really well. Anybody else want to com uh, commit, like, be honest about that, right? You know who lies to you better than you, better than anybody? You do. You're, you got a PhD in lying to yourself. You're amazing at it. You convince yourself of all kinds of things that aren't true, right? And then on top of that, we try to convince other people that those things are true as well, and that's within the church. That's in here, and so I need the truth. I need a good mirror. I need Jesus to say, I love you. I care for you. I want better for you. So look in this mirror so you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We need more of the truth and we need less lies. See, there's Jesus as the truth and then there's the lies of the world. There's Jesus as the truth and then there's the lies we tell to ourselves. Like when you hear Jesus, you hear truth, period. Period. That's it. And we have convinced ourselves that lies are okay. Little lies are okay. Not too long ago, we did a series called Live No Lies. If you didn't get a chance to watch it, I would love for you to go and check that out. There's a book by John Mark Comer, and he shares about how we live a life with no lies, how we live a life of 
truth because we tell ourselves lies here in the church, don't we? Like, you may not say this, but let's just be honest, right? We tell ourselves lies like money, success, and power. That's what leads to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is just as prevalent in the church as it is outside of the church. That should be convicting for us. Lies that say, if you find the right one, then he or she will finally bring you life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then you're married for two weeks and you're like, oh, this is harder actually, (laughs) right? Right? It's better, it's more beautiful, it's deeper, but it's harder. And it doesn't just make you happy all the time, does it? We tell lies like we say, all we need is love. Da, 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 right, okay? But we don't let Jesus define what love is, but we instead say it's this mushy, gushy, whatever makes you feel good, instant gratification definition of love. What we pursue is not true. What we often pursue is the lies of the world. That if you just finally had that, that bump in pay, that it would finally be better and you'd feel free. That if you just met him or her, you, you'd finally find love and be free. That, that if, you just, if you just loved yourself a little more, you'd finally be free. And these are lies from the devil, lies from the world around us. And what we need to do is stare at the truth, at the red letters of Jesus, that he would define for us what is good and what is true in our lives. Greater freedom isn't without constraint. Greater freedom is not without constraint. You're not free to do everything that you want to do. Christian, greater freedom is found staring at Jesus and asking the teacher and the truth to tell you what to do, how to live, how to love, how to encourage, how to challenge, how to be a good citizen, how to parent. It tells you, he tells you, he teaches you because he is the truth. Six chapters later, from this passage, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We have a world that's telling us there's lots of ways to get there, and Jesus himself did not agree with that statement. Jesus said there is one way to the Father, and it's through Jesus alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, found in scripture alone. This this is our declaration. This is our declaration. And everything else is a lie. Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life. He's our teacher, and he is the truth. But but it, it gets harder than that. I mean, that already feels heavy, doesn't it? But let's keep going, because what ultimately keeps us from this even greater freedom, it's not just not recognizing the truth and not just listening to the teacher. What is even more harmful is this. What ultimately keeps us from an even greater freedom is sin. Sin. Let's call it what it is, church. Let's call it what it is, all right? There is sin in my life that separates me from God. There is sin in your life that separates you from God. And that's bad news, because here's what Jesus says. Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a what? Slave to sin. Is a slave to sin. That doesn't sound free to me, does it? Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Not, not, Not good, and here's even worse. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family. What? So not only does it separate me from God, but it doesn't allow me place in the family. It doesn't allow me a a good father. It doesn't allow me the inheritance. What? This is bad news, right? Welcome to church. Happy 4th of July, everybody. Sin separates you from God and you're not part of the family. Oh, okay. Okay. That's not the 4th of July I was expecting, right? This is rough. But, but Jesus wants us to, to lean into this. I talked about this last week at the Forged Men's Retreat, right? 
Sin is the enemy. Sin is the enemy. Make no mistake, behavior modification is not the enemy. Now, should you do behavior modification? Yeah, yeah, like my dog needs treats, so I, you know, I'd like, he'd sit, okay, good, right? I need that in my life. I need good habits in my life. I talk about habits all the time in my trainings and teachings with guys, right? We talk about those habits and, and we're doing behavior modifications. We're trying to help shape our brain, but all of that is founded in the idea that Jesus leads us to truth, Jesus is our teacher, and that ultimately we are waging war with sin within ourselves and the world around us, right? Why is church so complicated? Because you're a bunch of sinners, that's why, right? You, you guess what? So am I, so are your leaders. Like, what did you do? Why did you put us in charge? We're sinners too, right? I mean, the ship is sinking and sin is the enemy and we play around with this. I'm gonna lean a little bit, like I haven't been already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Last week, I was at the men's retreat and I just said, this is how men's retreats go. And so if you don't know how men's retreats go, here you go. Men get together and they like shoot guns and make tons of bacon, like so much, there was so much bacon, Scott. Like so much bacon, right? Lots of smoked meats and cheeses and there's, you know, we have problems later in the, I'm not gonna go there. Okay, so it's bad, it's bad. It's, it's rainy and it smells and there's cigars involved, and you're like, what is this? And it's a men's retreat. And then somebody gets really vulnerable in a men's retreat, and it's like, oh, I'm struggling with something. And, and then like three other guys are like, yeah, me too. And then, and then here's what happens, you guys. And I, I pushed on this this past week. A lot of times what we like to do is like, the men like to muddle in the mud a little bit and be like, you're like that too, me too. And we're starting to give ourselves permission permission to be sinful. And then we get back to the men's retreat the next year and, and somebody gets vulnerable again and is like, oh, I'm struggling with this sin. And then, then the rest of them are like, yeah, me too. And you're like, did, did we murder sin this year or not? Or are we just playing in the mud? Like, do we just, do we just want somebody to pat us on the back and, and be like, it's okay. I struggle with that too. We're all in the same boat and it's sinking. And you know, like it's just, it's sin. No, listen, sin is the enemy. Sin is the enemy, right? It, it doesn't allow us freedom and it doesn't allow us a place in the family of God. It enslaves us. It's the opposite of freedom. And, and so that's dire news, but the good news is this. Because I think there's a piece of us that, and I said this at the men's retreat too, we're like, well, we'll man up and we'll conquer the sin, which I actually, like, I, I think we need to take that a little more serious, right? Like, I do think we need to set ourselves against all that is sin and do everything within our strength to fight the battle that has been put before us. But we also have to do that recognizing something. And that something is very important because you can't save yourself. That's truth from the teacher. I can't save myself. And here's the beauty that is offered to us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the good news at the end of the sermon, that Jesus offers us an even greater freedom. Jesus offers us an even greater freedom. In Jesus' death upon the cross, in his resurrection from the grave, he offers us the solution to this sin, and he offers us a greater freedom in his family. He says this, but a son belongs to it forever, meaning belongs to the family forever. Not just for a little while, not just, not just today, but forever. Past, present, and future. A son belongs to the family forever. So if the son sets you free, then you will be free indeed. Brandon said, are you gonna go Braveheart? And I'm really tempted to right now, okay? <laughs> like everything in me, and I won't do it because it's a bad accent, okay? 
If the Son sets you free, then you will be free indeed. Do you understand this, church? It is the Son, it is Jesus who sets you free. The teacher and the truth, he sets you free that you might be free indeed. Have you grasped that freedom yet? Have you held on to that freedom yet? Have you called out, cried out for that freedom yet? Have you received that freedom yet? Have you lived into that freedom yet? That is what is offered to you today. Full inheritance in the family of God. The son who sets you free that you may embrace freedom in this week. Freedom in your family. Freedom in your marriage. Freedom at your workplace. Freedom in your finances. A freedom that I don't think, church, that we have grasped yet. And I want to call us to it. Because what if we were the most free people in the world? I don't think there'd be enough seats. I just don't. I just don't think there'd be enough church buildings. I don't. If, if, we, if we could live into the fullness of freedom that Jesus has given to us, what would it look like for you, for our country, for our world? This is the charge. This is the offer. It's the gift of freedom given to you by the teacher by the truth, Jesus himself. This week we celebrate freedom, paid for with the blood of many in our military. But today and every day, we celebrate freedom, paid with the blood of our Savior and Lord, the teacher and the truth, Jesus Christ. This and this alone is where freedom is found. That you would bend your knee to the creator of heaven and earth, that you would turn your ear and eye to him, that you would be humble and allow him to teach you and that he would pour his truth upon you and that you would live in a freedom that you have never yet experienced. That is the offer to you. That is the offer to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the freedom that you offer. Jesus, I thank you for your sacrifice for us on the cross, that it is through your shed blood that you are the one and only sacrifice needed for us, and that all we need to do is turn to you and embrace the freedom you have to give, that we might see that freedom play out in our lives with our friends, with our families, and with the world around us. God, just... I feel it in my bones that this is what we need more than anything right now. I need it. We need it. So many others need it. And so grant us that open spirit, God. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Nourish us and make us free. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.